I hope you are rejoicing in the Lord today. This week, Kathy and I were supposed to be in New York visiting our grandchildren, but late last week, the governor of New York stated that if you are traveling to New York from the state of Alabama, you had to self-quarantine for 14 days upon your arrival, so that nixed our trip. And uh, that's the second time this year that we've had to cancel our vacation to go see our children and our grandchildren. But we are still rejoicing in the Lord and uh, grateful for the opportunity that I have to uh, lead you in a short Bible study. We are making our way through the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been focusing on some short parable sayings at first. And uh, today I want to talk to you about uh, a, a short parable saying I am calling green tree, dry tree, green tree, dry tree. So if you have a Bible, Luke chapter 23 and verse 31, Luke 23, 31, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> as he said this, for if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Let's read that again. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Now, this parable saying is the last recorded words of the Lord Jesus Christ before he was put on the cross. When Christ was on the cross, he spoke seven times. But just prior to the cross, Christ spoke this parable saying. Folks, if the innocent one suffered, what will the suffering of the guilty be like? That's the focus of this parable saying. If the innocent one suffered, the Lord Jesus Christ, the innocent one, what will the suffering of the guilty be like? Now I want you to notice several things as we kind of break down this parable saying. And the first is the location of the parable. Now I want you to see two different aspects of the location of this parable. First, the street. The street. The place where Christ spoke this parable was the street or the road from Pilate's Hall to Calvary where Christ was crucified. You'll remember that Christ endured three Jewish trials, then three Roman trials. His uh, final trial was before Pilate. Once condemned and sentenced to die, Christ was escorted from the Judgment Hall of Pilate to Golgotha, or the place of the skull. Uh, traditionally, the road upon which Christ walked has been referred to uh, as either Via Crucia, the way of the cross, or Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. You've probably heard at least one of those uh, designations in the past. Along this road, Christ was the center of attention. He had been brutally scourged by Pilate's soldiers. He had been crowned with thorns. And as the soldiers led him to Calvary, a great crowd was on the street following Christ. You see, folks, God made sure that the crucifixion of Christ had many witnesses. So there's this aspect of the street that he was on. Christ was on the street, throngs of people around him, and he spoke this saying. But I also want you to see, in addition to the street, I want you to see the scorn. The location where Christ spoke this parable was not a place of pleasure for Christ. It was one of pain. He was not surrounded by his friends. He was surrounded by his foes. Once again, we see Christ speaking a parable in the midst of a very hostile situation. Folks, Christ did not let hostility stop him. He did not let animosity stop him from teaching great truths. Occasionally, I'll have the opportunity to talk to pastors who want to leave their churches in order to preach at some nice church where there's no opposition and everyone is eager to hear the pastor proclaim 
the, the truth of the Word of God. Listen, folks, if you cannot proclaim Christ's, if you cannot proclaim God's message in a place of opposition, then you're not going to do well preaching God's message anywhere. See, Christ provides all of us with a great example. He did not allow persecution or opposition to stop him, and neither should we. So when you're facing persecution or opposition in your life, think of the example of the Lord Jesus Christ and press on. Don't let opposition or persecution stop you from proclaiming the truths of the Word of God. So there we have the location of the parable, the street and the scorn. But now let's take a look at the language of the parable. In looking at the language of this parable, we see three things. I want you to see a comparison, the compassion, and the condemnation. First, let's look at the comparison. The comparison of this parable saying concerns two different kinds of trees. Green, and the other one is dry. By a green tree, Christ does not mean a young and tender tree, but one that's fully grown and flourishing. By a dry tree, he means a tree that is withered and dead. And here's the comparison. A green tree is hard to burn, but a dry tree is easy to set on fire. Green wood is hard to burn and is symbolic of the innocent. Dry wood kindles easy and is symbolic of the guilty. During a forest fire, for example, green trees full of sap and moisture, you know, they crackle in the flame. But old dry trees are quickly consumed by the fire. So the comparison in this parable is saying that if a green tree is burning, how much more will a dry tree burn? That's the comparison. Secondly, notice the compassion. Very specifically, this parable is demonstrating Christ's compassion for the people who would experience the judgment that was to shortly come upon Jerusalem. Jerusalem would experience a great deal of trouble in the future, and Christ uses this parable to express his concern. Now, here is another great example that Christ provides for us. Christ is suffering beyond human understanding, and yet he expresses his compassion to, towards those around him. This is a wonderful demonstration of the unselfishness of Jesus Christ. Even on his journey to the cross, Christ was thinking of others, not thinking of himself. Folks, Christ's compassionate concern for others is a great rebuke to us. When we have troubles in our lives, we usually show more concern for ourselves than for the needs of others. Christ always put others first. The compassion. The comparison. And now notice number three, the condemnation. The condemnation. Christ's language in this parable is also a language of condemnation. Christ is condemning the actions of those who are crucifying him, and he's announcing the future condemnation upon Israel. God is a God of love and wrath. He spares believers, but he judges unbelievers. The same cloud which was bright to Israel was dark to the Egyptians. The same Lord Jesus who invites the laboring and the heavy laden to come to him and rest also declares that unless a man repents, he will perish. The same Savior who holds out his hands 
to the disobedient will one day come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God. Folks, Christ is gracious, but one day, the day of grace will end. So we've looked at the location of the parable, the language of the parable, and now let me talk briefly on the lessons from the parable. The primary application of this parable concerned the fact that Christ could be treated so cruelly even though he was innocent. What greater cruelty was going to come upon Jerusalem, which was full of wicked people? If wicked people can put Christ to death, being who he is, what will happen to them when judgment comes? Christ represents the green tree. If the green tree is burned, how much greater will the dry tree of the wicked, unbelieving Israel burn when judgment comes upon Israel? Now we know that judgment came upon Israel in A.D. 70. The Roman army, led by the future Emperor Titus, besieged and conquered the city of Jerusalem. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us 1.1 million people were killed in the siege, and 97,000 people were captured and enslaved. And note this lesson as well. If God allowed his only begotten son to be crucified when God found sin imputed to Christ, what shall God do to those when he finds sin ruling and reigning in their lives? Now let me close with this. I think the principle of this parable is illustrated for us by Peter. And all of us should take great care to learn the lesson that Peter's teaching. Turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, what shall the ungodly and the sinner, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? If God chastens his own people, if he disciplines and corrects Christians who disobey him, what will happen to those who reject the gospel? Folks, it is infinitely better for people to endure suffering now as believers, being chastened and cleansed, than to later bear eternal torment as unbelievers. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, today is the day of salvation. I pray you'll repent of your sin, place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, him and him alone, for the salvation of your soul. If you know Christ as your personal Savior, I pray that despite persecution, despite the obstacles and the difficulties of the day, you will still be firm in your resolve to present the truth of the gospel to those around you, and to continue to proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of the soul. May God bless you.